Good afternoon. Don't have my watch on. Good afternoon, brothers and sisters, Church of the Living God. Hello. Please get your authorized version of the scriptures. And please turn with me in your authorized version of the scriptures to Book of Romans, chapter 5. I'm going to start there. This video is a collaborated effort. A beloved, beloved brother uh, sent an outline here, and we've been going through it. Um, and uh, Lord willing, <laughs> Lord willing, but like I said, this, is, this video is a collaborated effort. So, um, without any further ado, please get your authorized version of the scriptures. And please, follow me along in the scriptures. Word by word, verse by verse, okay? It's very important to do so. Okay? Let's go. Romans chapter 5. Verses 1 on to verse 5. Look at the scriptures, man. Don't look at this face. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Hope of the glory of God. The glory of God. Hope of the glory of God. What would be God's glory? Redeeming his purchased possession. That is our hope. The redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Being caught up. Okay? And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also. Knowing that tribulation worketh... Ooh, boy! Come on. Say it. Say it with me. Knowing that tribulation worketh... Patience. And patience, experience. And experience hope. And hope maketh not a shame. Because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Verses 18 on to verse 25. See... We go through things as the church of the body of Christ. Okay, the church of the living God. Excuse me. We go through things to grow our faith and our dependence. See, what can happen is someone could be of the church of the living God, but yet tend to get self-sufficient. When we, as the church of the living God, I believe, like it saith in the scripture, give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me food convenient for me. Okay? Lest I steal and take the name of the Lord my God in vain. Or if I'm rich, say, hey, who is the Lord? See? We are to be kept in a state of dependence. A state of working dependence. Because it is the Lord who will provide for our needs. We need to put legs into these things, obviously. Yes, we don't just sit here saying, oh, please, Lord, shower upon me. No, 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 no. No. you got to put legs into our prayers, as it is said. But, we are to be kept in a state of working dependence upon the Lord. Okay? Romans chapter 8, verses 18 on to verse 25. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And what is that glory? Being redeemed. Being caught up. Giving, be, being given our rewards. 
okay? And verse 18 here, put this in context with what's going on today. Okay? Others say kind of a hush right now. Things just seem to be going along, right? Yeah. Yeah, let's continue. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. You and I are the creature. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, to wit, the redemption of our body. For we are saved by hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? And of course you can reference Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 and verse 5. But if we hope for what we see not, then do we with patience, patience, wait for it. Wait for it. And of course, I, I mentioned it. Let's let's see this reference, Hebrews chapter eleven. Hebrews chapter eleven. Hebrews chapter eleven, verse one and <coughs> verse six. Excuse me. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not see, seen. Excuse me. In verse six, but without faith, it is impossible to please Him, for he that cometh to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Okay? Now go to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, beginning at verse 20. Colossians chapter 1, beginning at verse 20, on to the close of the chapter. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven, and you, that were sometime alienated, and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. If you are saved, born again, converted of the church of the living God. Obviously. Okay? In the body of his flesh, through death, to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. Meaning that we, once he saves you, you are sealed. You are part of his body. You are part of his bones and his flesh. Okay? If ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, 
whereof I, Paul, am made a minister, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. And that's not talking about a building, obviously. But that's talking about you and I. Okay? Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. What mystery is this? Oh, the mystery of the uh, Satanic Roman Catholic Trinity? No. The mystery of the Pucharist? No. What is this mystery? Let's find out. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is, ready? Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you. Now note two things about this verse. Mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. See, we are his bones, we are of his bones and of his flesh. We are his ambassadors here on earth. Okay? We belong to him. He will not deny himself. See? And when you are sealed, saved, born again, converted, you are given the gift of the Holy Ghost. Christ in you. The hope of glory. The hope of glory. Whose glory? Glory of the Lord. To redeem his purchased possession. But see, as we all know, that takes a little patience on our part, doesn't it? Let's continue this. Whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, wisdom is to fear the Lord, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. And that is not sinlessly perfect. That perfection is that perfect of heart. A pure heart. A pure heart is a broken heart. A pure heart is a heart that truly belongs to the Lord. Okay? Whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. See, <clears throat> there are those out there who will tell you, the Lord saves you, you're sealed, but yet, now you don't do anything. No, that's not true. We have been saved. Okay, we have been saved. The Lord saves us. We are henceforth called to go out to be zealous of good works, to do good works, not to save ourselves or to stay saved. Okay? But we don't just sit here. Okay, that's not the patience. We go through these tribulations. We go through these things to increase our faith, to make our faith strong, okay? To depend on the Lord, not on ourselves, see? Okay? And of course, go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Verses 9 on to verse 23. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you as the church of the living God, you know this, you can, God can get mad, excuse me, God can get angry at his own. Because of why? Disobedience. Meddling with things that they ought not to meddle, yes. But see, God's wrath 
we are delivered from. What is God's wrath at the time of Jacob's trouble? Say? Hence, you and I today, especially with what's going on right now and what is coming very soon, okay? That's why you and I as laborers are out there, okay? Zealous of good works, preaching the true Christ Jesus of the scriptures, okay? That's why we are out there, okay? He doesn't save us just to leave us sit here. No, no. Let's continue. Who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wake or sleep, okay? Whether we be alive or whether we be dead, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as, even as also ye do. Brothers and sisters, we are to comfort one another and edify one another. Rebuke, chasten, that kind of thing, okay? The Lord will use us sometimes, obviously, for that uh, purpose. But, okay, let's continue. And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you, and are over you in the Lord, and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake, and be at peace among yourselves. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward some men, all men. See that none render evil for evil unto, ever, unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. And of course, we have to read this. Of course, rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. In everything. For the good that's going on. And for the bad. When you go through tribulation, when you go through trials, okay, it's very easy to say, thank you, Lord, for all the wonderful uh, provision you have given us. Thank you. But when things seem to be lacking, when things seem to, for some reason, start to fall apart, it says, in everything give thanks. In everything. For this is the will of God and Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the Spirit. Remember, brethren, our Lord never holds a gun at your head forcing you to do anything. You will always have to remember that. Okay? You have to remember that. God does not want a robot. God wants you to choose. Okay? Choose Him. Because He could. God could make every single solitary person, spirit, soul, and body, that's what a person is, love Him and serve Him. He could do that. But would that be genuine? No. No. And you can quench the spirit by disobedience, not adhering your life according to the scriptures. Doing the things of the world. Mingling yourself among those of the world. Despise not prophesying. Prophesying. Someone who is speaking to you through the Holy Ghost and the Lord Jesus Christ as that spirit through the scriptures. Ignoring God's word, his admonition, his rebuke, his chastening that comes to you through the scriptures. It's another surefire way to quench the spirit. 
Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. And there is none good but one. That is God. Abstain from all appearance from evil. Get away from it. Remember, we're called unto holiness, being separate there. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. Here's what a person is. And I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is what Paul is talking about with having patience and with patience experience and experience hope. The more the Lord puts you through, the more you learn to depend on Him. The more He puts you through, the more you go through, the more mistakes you make. Because you're going to make mistakes. Hello. You're going to make a lot of mistakes. That's the way it is. It's a growth. You're growing. Okay? You're saved. Sealed. Born again. You come to the Lord on His terms. Broken and contrite. You fear the Lord. Cry out for His mercy and forgiveness. Call upon the name of the Lord. Okay? He saves you. You come to Him on His terms. Not your own. You are of his body. But you go through a process of sanctification, of growth, of learning. And the more you go through, the more patient you become. <laughs> and the more you see the Lord's provision throughout it all, The Lord won't let you down. You understand? Titus chapter 2 verses 11 on to verse 15. Titus chapter 2 verses 11 on to verse 15. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Does it mean that all men are saved? Of course not. No. It's available. There it is. For you are saved by grace through faith. So, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. He's there. God is there. It has appeared unto all men. Salvation by grace through faith is available to all. Not everyone is going to be saved by our Lord because some have already chosen to serve the devil. There are those that have gone past that point of no return. Yes, but as verse 11 states, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, whereas the easy believism heretic that goes over, that skips over brokenness and contrition, and then um, has a big problem with the changed life after salvation, that you are a new creature. In Christ Jesus, okay? Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. No, oh, brethren. Hey, you. You still struggling with them video games, huh? Well, 
nobody sees it, just me. Yeah. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts get shortcuts. Um, integrate yourself into that Looking for that blessed hope. And the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Look at that verse. Looking for that blessed hope. The blessed hope. The redemption of the purchased possession. The catching away. And the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior. Second coming. Okay. You and I, Church of the Living God, we're going to hear come up hither. Eventually. Someday. Yes. The blessed hope. And then, and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Because after we, the church of the living God, get caught up, as we all know, the time of Jacob's trouble begins. And then it's only a quick matter of time before our Lord come back with you and I, his bride, his church. Okay? Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. A peculiar people. A peculiar, a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Wanting to do good works, not for salvation, not to stay saved. Here I am. Use me, Lord. <laughs> Where the Lord says, uh, Who shall go for us? Who shall I send? Isaiah says, Here I am. Send me. That's Isaiah chapter 6, by the way. Go look that up on your own time. Zealous. We want to serve the Lord. But you got to be careful, too. You don't want to do something in your own power. But wait on the Lord for Him to guide you into that. Okay? You gotta be careful of that. You gotta be mindful of that. How are you? How do you keep yourself mindful of that? Oh, search the scriptures daily whether these things be so. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. Okay? Now go to Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8. We will be reading verses 4 on to verse 15. Luke chapter 8 verses 4 on to verse 15. And when much people were gathered together, and were come to him out of every city, he spake by a parable. A sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and it was thrown down, and the fowls of the air devoured it. And some fell upon a rock, lowercase r by the way, and as soon as it was sprung up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it, and choked it. And other fell on good ground, and sprang up, and bare fruit an hundredfold. And when he had said these things, and when he had said these things, he cried, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. And his disciples asked him, 
saying, what might this parable be? I, I love this part of it. And he said, unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. Kingdom of God. Kingdom of God can mean either the spiritual or the actual literal kingdom of heaven that is in Jerusalem, okay? For example, when you see kingdom of heaven in the book of Matthew, every single time the kingdom of heaven is referring on to the physical, literal, actual kingdom in Jerusalem, where our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, is going to rule and reign from, from 4,000 years, the kingdom of heaven. When you see that, every single time, boom, okay? By context, by context, okay? You know, the, the verse in the middle, and there's one up there and one down there. The context, by context, you can discover what kingdom of God is being used as in reference. Unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. This is referring unto spiritual, not the actual physical literal kingdom. But unto others in parables, that seeing they might, may, they might not see, and hearing they might not understand. Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God, the scriptures, okay? It's not a capital W. Capital W, word of God, is always a reference unto our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father himself, okay? Those by the wayside are they that hear, then cometh the devil, and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. Also, too, keep in mind, this is before the crucifixion, the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? This is before that. Doctrinally, still under the law, because the perfect sacrifice for, sacrifice for sin had yet to be made. Keep that in mind. Okay? Verse 13, they on the rock are they which when they hear receive the word with joy. Oh, that sounds good, doesn't it? Yeah. And these have no root, which for a while believe, and in time of temptation fall away. When they're tried, when they're put to the test, Satan does a lot, is allowed to do a lot of that for these people who, when they hear, oh, that sounds great, oh, I believe it. Pilgrim's Progress is a very good example of, of that, about the one guy who followed Christian at first and then went away after, I can't remember offhand which one that is, if one of you can remember, put that in the, link, uh, in the comment section, okay? But yeah, they hear the word, the scriptures, oh, that sounds good. Yeah. Then they get uh, attacked for it. Then they're put in a situation where they are to stand for it. And what happens? See? Verse 14. And that which fell among thorns are they which, when they have heard, go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. Okay. And bring no fruit to perfection. Other elsewhere in the um, the this parable appears um, another time, uh, say in Matthew, where it is uh, said that immediately, immediately, meaning. Oh, let's look at that. But hold on, hold on. 
But that on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it and bring forth fruit with patience. Patience. Go to. Go to Matthew. Oh. Go to. Where is this one? Matthew 13. Matthew 13. Go to Matthew 13. I want, I want you to see something. Matthew chapter 13. One second, brethren. We've got to pause this. Okay, sorry about that. I had the wrong one. Go to Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. Okay, let's get ourselves another take on this. Okay, Mark chapter 4. Another brother pointed this out to me uh, some time ago. Very telling. Check this out. Mark chapter 4, verses 13 on to verse 20. Check this out. Okay, same parable. But look at this. And he said unto them, Know ye not this parable? Uh, Mark 4, verses 13 on to verse 20. And how then will ye know all parables? The sower, that's you, soweth the word. And these are they by the wayside, where the word is sown. But when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately. Immediately. Because Satan doesn't want to lose someone that's uh, taken by his will to be saved by our Lord Jesus Christ. So he's swift. Those of you brethren, sisters, when the Lord saved you, how quickly did Satan send people to you to try to get you out of the, out of the way? Hmm? I can remember when the Lord first saved me over 13 years ago, that um, Satan used the Jehovah's Witnesses, Charismatics, okay, to try to get me out of the way. See, it didn't work. But it says here in Mark, Satan cometh immediately. He doesn't want to lose anyone to the Lord. And taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. Satan is quick. Satan is fast. Okay? He is. He moves quickly. Especially when someone got, uh, gets saved by the Lord. Satan wants to send. He, he moves quickly. It's like, hey, let me accuse it. Let, let, see this guy? Yeah. Let me try him. Let me try him. Verse 16. And these are they likewise which are sown on stony ground, rock, who, when they have heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness. Woohoo! Yeah! Right? Yeah. A lot of these false converts today, I believe, are in this category, where they have some hireling in a satanic church building. They're all satanic, by the way. Preaching to you this feel-good message, you know, to itch your ears, that kind of thing. Then they get out there. And again, they're put in situations. And these are they likewise, which are sown on stony ground, who when they have heard the word immediately, receive it with gladness, and have no root in themselves. And so endure but for a time. Afterward, when affliction or persecution ariseth, for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. Oh, and, and you'll, you'll know these types when you see them. You, you will. You will. Trust me. <laughs> you will. The ones who are uh, Christian in name only. 
but when you think about what's going on today and how the term Christian is so anyway but you will see this people who will immediately you know hear a good word they love to hear your preaching they love to hear the word they sit before you as my people as one who plays a lovely song they will hear your words, but they will not do them. That's from the book of Ezekiel. You go find that, okay? Verse 18. And these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lusts of other things enter in, entering in, Choke the word, and it become and it becometh unfruitful. The it is not the person, spirit, soul, or, or body. Okay, that's not what that's talking about. And it becometh unfruitful. No, it's talking about in this in here. Look at it. Look at verse nineteen. And the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches. And the lusts of other things entering in choke the word, and it, the word, becometh unfruitful. Because whoever this person is allowed the cares of this world to come in. And it become unfruitful. It doesn't grow. Okay? These, these I think are the ones who are going to be in the more hot water, so to speak. Because it said the word becometh, and it becometh unfruitful. What becomes unfruitful? The word. God's word has this habit of sticking around, even in lost people. They seem to remember it, but they will quench it. Just like those who are of the church of the living God can quench it. Quench the spirit. who will speak to you through the word. See. And these are they which are sown on good ground. Such as hear the word. And receive it. Faith cometh by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. And bring forth fruit. Some thirtyfold. Some 60, some 100. Fruit of patience is bringing, full, uh, bringing forth fruit. Some 30, some 60, some 100. Because you've got to remember, go to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Did I unpause that? Yes. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8, on to verse 10. For by grace, grace are ye saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Your salvation is a gift. Of God given to you by his grace because through faith okay for by grace God's favor God's unmerited favor onto you the sinner who put him there on the cross okay God's favor unmerited on your behalf. You can merit it even if you try. Okay? For by grace are ye saved. Grace comes first. Through faith. And that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. See, if you say I just believe faith alone. That's of yourself. It is by grace through faith. Not of works, lest any man should boast. The works are that he is referring to are the works of the law. 
Okay? The works of the law. That is what he is referring to. Lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Walk in newness of life. Good works. After salvation. Not to stay saved. Not to save yourself but as ambassadors. And brother, sister, doesn't the lost need to behold the good works of those who are of Christ Jesus and saying, I ain't doing that, man. <laughs> I, no, no. No, I'm not, I'm not taking your, your I'm not uh, messing around with the steel of the Jesuit poniard. Okay? I'm not messing around with that. Go to Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3. Titus. Not Hebrews. Close. <laughs> Titus chapter 3. Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers. Obey everybody. Obey everything the government tells you. To obey magistrates. To be ready to every good work. Every good work. Um, subjecting yourself to the steel of the Jesuit poniard. It's not a good work, dear friend. That's murder. Murder. You mess around with the steel of the Jesuit poniard? You're not dying. You're dead. You're dead. And all the while you got these Christians in the church building. The ones out there call themselves Christians. Not of the church of the living God. We need distinction, brother. Remember that. Remember that. Telling people that it's a godly thing. That it's a godly thing. To subject yourself to the steel of the Jesuit poniard. You're not dying. You're dead. Let's continue. We all have, unfortunately, people. I have family members who have taken it. My wife, of course, or our family. We have people who have taken it. You see why patience is so important right now for us, Church of the Living God? Why it is necessary that we maintain good works in the sight of in, in the sight of those for the glory of our Lord, not to be seen of men, but because He first loved us. Therefore, we'll get to that here in a little bit. Okay. Let's continue. To speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, shewing all meekness unto all men. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, living as if there is no God, disobedient, deceived, serving divers lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. Got to remember that. 
Got to remember that when outside your door, brother, sister. Got to remember that. You always got to keep that in the back of your mind. Not to close off everything straight away. Keep that in mind. But after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a faithful saying, and these things I will allow that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. But avoid foolish questions. Yeah. And genealogies. And contentions. And strivings about the law. For they are unprofitable and vain. I can't tell you how many emails I get of foolish questions. And I'm, I'm not talking about brethren who uh, send me questions like there are several, my brother from Croatia, I have several sisters, and other brothers uh, from mm, all over that ask really good questions and got a whole list of them. <laughs> but uh, there are, I also get quite a few <laughs> from those who are asking foolish questions that don't want to hear an answer. They just are asking questions to start strife and debate. And genealogies. Son? Beware of the who is the true Jew thing. Okay? Okay? The video on that, Lord willing, is coming. Oh, well, I've already, already addressed that. But um, a video on kindred, kindreds, hopefully, Lord willing, will be coming sometime soon in the future. Hopefully. Okay? You watch it there, son. With the genealogy thing. Be careful. And strivings about the law... Why are we to avoid all the, why are we not to mingle with all these things? For they are unprofitable and vain. They lead to more questions. They lead to more strife. A man that is an heretic, after the first and second admonition, reject. Knowing that he that is such is subverted, and sinneth, being condemned of himself. Ha! <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm thinking of quite a few of you right offhand. See, and I personally, I, I try to apply this. I do. But see, um, narcissistic, uh, sociopathic devils who thinks the, wor the world revolves around them in all facets, that everything you say is about them, uh, they like to stir up things and open up uh, old wounds, so to speak. Well, we as the Church of the Living God are like, look, I ain't got time for that stuff. Dear friend, um, I ain't got time for that stuff. I ain't got time for that. There are more important things to worry about and to deal with than some deluded, narcissistic sociopath who done gone crazy long ago. Okay? 
got better things to do. Okay? As well do you, brethren. As well do you. First and second admonition reject. Why? Knowing that he knowing that he that is such is subverted and sinneth being condemned of himself. When I shall send Artemis unto thee, or Tychicus, be diligent to come unto me to Nicopolis, where I have determined there to win winter. Bring Zenus the lawyer and Apollos on their journey diligently, that nothing be wanting unto them. And let ours also learn to maintain good works for necessary uses, that they be not unfruitful. All that are with me salute thee. Greet them that love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. Amen. Look at verse 14. And let ours, the Church of the Living God, also learn to maintain good works for necessary uses, that they be not unfruitful, that the things of the world don't come in and choke you, see. See that? Now go to Psalm 34. Psalm 34. <laughs> now, sitting here, going through this with you, uh, you know, I've said this before, you know, you see me, but this ain't a one-man show, okay? Suggestions, questions, verses, hey, Brad, what do you think of this? Hey, Brad, he's like, oh, I've got, I'm in the thing on my email, I've got a whole thing about what, what do you think about this, what do you think about this? So it's not a one-man show, okay? We are his body. We are his church, the church of the living God. And um, we support one another. My lack is supplied, our lack is supplied by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ through his body. Someone else's lack is supplied through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ by members of his body as well. It's a two-way street, see. This ain't a one-man show. The one for the Lord, for you, through you. Psalm 34. Psalm 34. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. The humble thereof, the humble shall hear thereof and be glad. O magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Why? Because he's worthy to be praised. Yes, let's keep reading. I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. In all things give thanks. They looked unto him and were lightened, and their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. Oh! Oh, do we got time? To tell you, to, to, to hear how the Lord has done that for my wife and I. Hmm? How about you, brother, sister? The angel of the Lord encampeth about them that fear him. Fear him and delivereth them, those who fear him. See, these easy believism heretics fear the Lord. What is the fear of the Lord to them? Nothing. Nothing. Because they're saved by their own belief. 
They teach people to have peace with their sin. Where we as the church of the living God, in patience, going through these tribulations, see, the patience and the fear of the Lord work hand in hand. Okay? We fear the Lord and uh, having patience on Him, okay? Having patience on Him. We fear Him not to take shortcuts, to do as the world. You know, when in Rome be as the Romans, bleh, you know? Okay? Patience and the fear of the Lord work hand in hand. Very good point about that, brother. Very good point about that. Very good point about that. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. There's none good but one. That is God. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. Oh, fear the Lord, ye his saints, for there is no want to them that fear him. You're going to fear that? Or are you going to fear the Lord? See, Christians, they teach you to fear the man. To fear man, we as the church of the living God, you better be afraid of the Lord. And what does that say? Oh, fear the Lord, ye His saints. There is no want to them that fear Him. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. Come, ye children, hearken unto me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Teach people the fear of the Lord by our example. By preaching the scriptures through the word. Okay? It's the fear of the Lord that keeps us away. That keeps us holy. Separate. Okay? Just think about it. You can go ahead right away and quench the spirit. What kind of chastening are you going to get? Hmm? Lord warns you. Don't do that. Don't you. Don't. Okay. You're going to do that? Fine. Go ahead. See what happens to you. What man is he that desireth life and loveth many days that he may see good? Keep thy tongue from evil and thy lips from speaking guile. <laughs> oh, oh. Yeah. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. And the God of all peace, the God of peace, sanctify your whole spirit, soul, and body. When you live holy, separate, you see? The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, and his ears are open unto their cry. The face of the Lord is against them that do evil, to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. Those out there that are pushing this psychological operation, this agenda, faces, uh, the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Don't forget that. If we got another five years, if we do, and they start dying. Let us all, Church of the Living God, try to remember that. Because in one way or another, we're going to be affected by it in one way or another. They'll get what's coming to them. The righteous cry, and the Lord heareth and delivereth them out of all their troubles. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken 
heart, and save us such as be of a contrite spirit. A, you easy believism, heretic devils, there's your requirement. That's Old Testament. Oh, shut up. Shut up. No, you are your own God because you save yourself because you have your belief. You didn't come to the Lord with a broken heart and a contrite spirit. Shut up. Shut up. That's not, that's, it's hard, but it's easy. The hard part is getting over yourself. That's what's hard for a lot of people. But once the Lord shows you just how despicable, high, how lowly you truly are, how deserving of how you are, that'll bring on contrition. Then when you realize, when he shows you that he died because of you, <laughs> hey try this sometime you come across a professing Christian one of these easy an easy believism heretic too all you easy believism heretics whose fault is it that Jesus Christ died buried and rose again the third day according to the scripture Whose fault is it? Brethren, you ask somebody that question who claims to be a Christian, do they speak in generalities? Generalities? Do they deflect? Or do they admit the truth and take responsibility? I've asked that to people before. I've only heard one time. Yeah. Try that. Try that. Try that. See, if someone speaks in a generality about that, whose fault was it that Christ went to the cross and died, buried, and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Who's responsible for that? I've heard the Jews. I've, I've heard, well, everybody. Satan. Whose fault is it? Little rabbit trail here. Bear with me. Whose fault? Who? Who is responsible? Who is responsible? I'll tell you. I'll show you. Now this is what the actual correct response is. But I tell you, someone who is truly broken and contrite are the only ones who can truly utter this out of a pure heart. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Who am I in chief? Now see, people, there are some out there, infiltrators, who know to say that. But see, in works they deny them. Even though they're very cautious about crossing their T's, dotting their I's. Oh, you look so good, don't you? There's not real evidence to show that you're fake. But see, you can't keep up that facade forever, dear boy. You ain't going to do it. There are those of, out there that have seen your slippage. 
And, and hey, I'm not talking about the one who thinks everything is about him. I'm not talking about you, okay? You know who you are, who I'm addressing anyway. So, you do everything right. You say the right things. You do all your things to be seen in front of men, right? Because you have men's persons in admiration. You're so phony, man. You're so phony. Verse 18, Psalm 34. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart and saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. He keepeth all his bones, not one of them is broken. Evil shall slay the wicked. And they that hate the righteous shall be desolate. They hate us, brethren. Those of the world, they hate us. These infiltrators, these Christians, they hate us. You already know that. Don't forget that. The Lord redeemeth the soul of his servants, and none, you want a good promise, brother, sister, and none of them that trust in him shall be desolate. Now that don't mean, that don't mean that because of what's coming, you might lose everything. I've heard and looked up some articles about what the government has proposed to do for those who don't fall in line with the steal of the Jesuits' poniard. Okay? Yeah, they might go after your bank account. <laughs> you could lose everything. See, the reality of that happening now is becoming more obvious, isn't it? And right now there's this lull for the storm, isn't there? Don't you never forget, brother, sister. The Lord redeemeth the soul of his servants. Redeemeth the soul of his servants. And none of them that trust in him shall be desolate. 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 1 on verse 12. We saw David. Praising the Lord for his deliverance, knowing, having full faith and assurance and trust on our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, that even though he slay him, you will trust in him. That's in Job chapter 15, I think. Go find that. Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. Yet I will maintain mine own ways before him. That's not uh, That wasn't Job being stubborn. No. Though, you, though things go, ha uh, go wrong with you here, things start happening to you because you take stands for the scriptures, for our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father. Continue on in the ways of the scriptures, as we are told. Don't let anything choke you. Let's, see. Let's continue. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, unto the church of God which is at Corinth, with all the saints which are in all Achaia. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. One and the same. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the soul of the Godhead, the Father of mercies, and the God of 
all comfort. Who comforteth like the Lord. Not the world, buddy. Who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble, by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation, consolation also aboundeth by Christ. And whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings which, also, which we also suffer. Or whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. And our hope of you is steadfast, knowing that as ye are partakers of the sufferings, so shall ye be also of the consolation. For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure, above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life. I, I've, we've talked about this before, but... <laughs> I remember um, my dear friend, our dear friend, our brother, our beloved brother Alexander Hartley, um, making uh, comments before, as as well myself, as well of, as you. I don't want to get up today, man. I just want no. I don't want to do anything. Things can happen in your life that. In so much that we despaired even of life. It happens. It happens. There are days when you will wake up where just knowing it's like, oh, what's going on out there? And you struggle with yourself, you're like, oh, Lord. What, who am I? What could, how, why would you use me to do anything? That happens to us. But, we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God which raiseth the dead. That working dependence on the Lord. See, the minute you start trusting in yourself, thinking that you're something, yeah, you're something, all right. See, the minute you start thinking, oh, I got enough, I can just, you know, uh, kick back and wait. Yeah. Yeah. See, it's a working dependence. Not working to save you. No, nothing like that. No, 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 no. Give us day by day our daily bread. Okay? Our Lord in several places mentions about those who, who you know, the one guy who, who had a whole bunch of goods, and he's like, I'm going to tear down my barns, build greater. Then I'll just kick back and relax and be, take life easy and talk about how the Lord has blessed me because I'm so good, how many people I've led to the Lord and so on and so forth. Yeah, no, it's a working dependence. Working dependence. That we trust on God, not ourselves. Because when things are going good, the Lord open up things onto you and start blessing you, that pride can get in there. You can start thinking that you are your own little God, can't you? What happens? <laughs> Tribulation? Suffering? Hmm? To bring you back down. Knowing that you can't eat unless the Lord lets you eat. 
You can't breathe, buddy, unless the Lord lets you breathe. You've been given today. You've been given today by God's grace. Even you wicked devils out there. Look at that verse again. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God which raiseth the dead, who delivered us from so great a death and doth deliver, in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. Ye also helping together by prayer for us, that for the gift bestowed upon us by the means of many persons, thanks may be given by many on our behalf. For our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience. The testimony of, your, of our conscience. How's your conscience there, man? <laughs> How's your conscience there? You, who's got a facade to keep up. I, I don't I pity you. I pity anyone who has this facade, a fake front that they have to maintain. I, I pity that. I do. I, I really pity those of you out there, not referring on to anyone of the Church of the Living God. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm referring, there are those of you out there who know who you are, who keep up a false front. What kind of life that must be to have to work to maintain your false appearance to look good in front of others when back here, when no one is looking uh, in the sight of these four walls. You're out there, brother, sister. For our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience. That in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, fear the man, a fear of man, that kind of thing, but by the grace of God, we have had our conversation in the world. And more abundantly to you, word. How's your conscience, brother, sister? Hmm? Void of offense? Can you walk out there with a clean conscience? The testimony of what? The testimony of our conscience. That in simplicity and godly sincerity. See, it's our, our conscience testifying as we walk out there according to the scriptures. And we are sealed until the day of redemption. So our conscience testifies because we are following the Lord according to the scriptures by our example given to us by the Apostle Paul. See. And 2 Corinthians chapter 2 verses 14 on to verse 17. Now thanks be unto God, which always causeth us to triumph in Christ, and maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. For we <laughs> are unto God a sweet savor of Christ, in them that are saved, and in them that perish. To the one we are the savor of death unto death, and to the other the savor of life unto life. And who is sufficient for these things? For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. Because Christ is in you. Christ in you, the hope of glory. I was informed recently that um, 
by a sister who would sing hymns, sing, just sing hymns unto, uh, unto our Lord, just praise God for hours. And hearing those hymns where the sister is kind of uh, cut the heart of those who heard them, the psalms, and troubled, bothered. See, when you sing songs and make melodies in your hearts unto the Lord through singing hymns, lots of people hear that. They don't like that, do they? It seems that lost people are more ready to hear the contemporary Christian music, right? Rather than the old time hymns. What is that that says uh, that you hear something from behind you saying, this is the way, walk ye in it, from behind you? Yeah, the old paths. I'm going to Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14. As I just closed the scriptures on that thing, I wanted us to, before we go to this, verse 9 in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves but in God which raiseth the dead. Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14. I did a video on this specifically a while ago, but Matthew chapter 14 verses 22 under verse 33. And straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him onto the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship... Think about what we just read in uh, 2 Corinthians. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went on to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, be of good cheer, it is I. Be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. When he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried saying, Lord, save me! And immediately, Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? And when they were come into the ship, the wind ceased. Then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him 
you uh, Jehos, yeah, our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, uh, was worshipped. That's one of the things that the Jehos, Jehovah's Witnesses, like to say that Jesus never let anyone worship him. Remember that verse. Saying, of a truth, thou art the Son of God. Look at that, verse 30. Peter took his eyes off of who? Yes, he took his eyes off of the Lord. And he saw the wind boisterous. And what was this wind doing? Verse 24, but the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And when Peter saw the wind, he saw the wind that it was what? Boisterous. You know, really crazy going, you know, rough. He was afraid and beginning to sink. He didn't plummet like a stone. <laughs> he began sinking. Because he took his eyes off of the Lord and was looking and noticed the wind that it was boisterous. Kind of like the thorns that came up and choked the word that it became unfruitful. And we are to trust in the Lord. We have the sentence of death in ourselves that we do not trust in ourselves but in the Lord who raised the dead. Not referring on to my brothers and sisters. Not referring on to you. On to those of you who may see this. What in the wide world of sports entertainment are you trusting on? A religion? Your good works to save you? Your belief? What are you trusting in? What are you tr who are you trusting on? See, if you're trusting on anyone else besides our Lord Jesus Christ, whether it be a religion, whether it be whatever it is, you're trusting on yourself. And boy, those winds sure can get boisterous, can't they? Look at them up there. Look at all this stuff that's happening right now. Brother, sister. Hmm? Go to First Chronicles. First Chronicles. Chapter 21. First Chronicles chapter 21 verses 1 on to verse 17. First Chronicles chapter 21. And Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. Now hold on. Right here. And Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. Um Remember in the book of Job where Satan went before the Lord and Satan said to the Lord, uh, you know, haven't you uh, put a hedge around Job and protected everything? I can't do anything to him because you won't let me. Okay? Hold your place here and go to 2 Samuel chapter 24. A while ago, I did a video on this. Uh, people, this will be brought up to some people. This has been brought up to me before uh, about a, con a contradiction in the scripture. Because right here in 1 Chronicles chapter 21, it says, And Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to, uh, to number Israel. 2 Samuel chapter 24, verse 1. And again the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And he moved 
David against them to say, Go number Israel and Judah. Now, there are those who are like, So the authorized version calls Satan the Lord. Or, whoa, this is a... No, this is not a contradiction. This is not a contradiction. Look at that verse. And again, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And he moved David against them to say, Go and number Israel. Go back to 1 Chronicles chapter 21. And Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. God allowed Satan to provoke David to number Israel. The Lord allowed it to happen. Okay? It's not a contradiction. The Lord allowed Satan to tempt David. It is not a contradiction. The scriptures are... <laughs> the scriptures are not calling Satan the Lord. Blasphemy. No. No. God allowed Satan to go and provoke David. Okay? It's not a contradiction. It's actually very simple to explain, as we just did. Keep that in mind if that if you ever run into that, brother, sister. I, I've run into it a couple times. It's very easy to debunk. But anyway, let's continue. In First Chronicles chapter 21. And Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. And David said to Joab and to the rulers of the people, Go number Israel, for Beersheba from Beersheba even to Dan, and bring the number of them to me, that I may know it. A little pride here in David. You gotta remember, David was a man after God's own heart. That means that he sought, was going after it. Doesn't mean, God forbid, that David had the heart of God. No, he was after his own heart. He went after it. He was seeking God's heart. That's what that means, okay? And we know... David had some pretty big oopsies. Killing Uriah the Hittite by the sword of the enemy because he uh, made his wife Bathsheba with child through adultery. Okay? And David gave Uriah the Hittite his own death sentence by his own hand and Uriah gave it to Joab and I believe it was against the children of Ammon. Okay? And then Joab, according to the death sentence that uh, Uriah handed him himself, went over and then, boom, got killed. So David killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword of the Ammonites, I believe it was. Okay? Real, and he wrought great consequences. Yeah, the Lord still used them, yeah. But the consequences he paid for that, evil came out of his own house. His son Absalom and Amnon and Amnon, okay? Yeah, he he paid a heavy price. He paid a heavy price. As king. As king. Right here. Right here. Says in Second Samuel that the anger of the Lord was stirred against Israel. And King David, who was uh, was allowed of Satan, uh, Satan was allowed to provoke him. Go number Israel from Beersheba even to Dan, and bring the number to, of them to me, that I may know them, that he may glory in men, that he may glory in flesh. See, and and check this. <laughs> Look at Joab of all people. Check this out. And Joab answered, The Lord make his people an hundred times so many more as they be. But my lord the king, are they not all my lord's servants? Why then doth my lord require this thing? 
Why will he be a cause of trespass to Israel? That coming from Joab, wow, wow, right? Joab, who murdered other people so he could keep his own position. Yeah. Went not after Absalom, but went after Adonijah. Yeah. Yeah. Don't, don't miss the gravity of that. Okay, let's continue. Nevertheless, the king's word prevailed against Joab. Wherefore, Joab departed and went throughout all Israel and came to Jerusalem. And Joab gave the sum of the number of the people unto David. And all they of Israel were a thousand thousand and an hundred thousand men that drew sword. And Judah was four hundred threescore and ten thousand men that drew sword. A lot of people. So David could glory in the number of his armies and flesh. Do you get the picture maybe that David took his eyes off of the Lord and turned it on to those of the world? Let's continue. But Levi and Benjamin counted he not among them. For the king's word was abominable to Joab. And God was displeased with this thing. Therefore he smote Israel. Let's continue. Verse 8. And David said unto God, I have sinned greatly because I have done this thing. But now I beseech thee, do away with the iniquity of thy servant, for I have done very foolishly. Look at those eyes. Look at the eyes. Don't look at me. Look at the eyes. Okay? I have sinned greatly. I have done this thing. I beseech thee, for I have done very foolishly. King, taking responsibility for what he had done. What a concept! You know, like the uh, old man, the Adamic nature, is it is called, of the woman. Yeah, I messed up, but it's really your fault because you gave me the woman who did give me of the tree and I eat. And because of your fault and the woman that you gave me is why I messed You get it, right? Let's continue. And the Lord spake unto Gad, David's seer, saying, Go and tell David, saying, Thus saith the Lord, I offer thee three things. Choose thee one of them, that I may do it unto thee. Can you imagine that? Church of the living God. You sin a great sin. Okay? God forgives you. You confess. Repent. It's like, Lord, Lord I, 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 I'm sorry. Forgive me. I repent of that. Forgive me. He'll forgive you. That doesn't remove the consequences of your actions. I have a two-part video on consequences. Link them in this video. Okay? But can you imagine that? Can you imagine that? Our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father. Uh, the Lord Jesus that these people, these Christians say that loves everybody. I'm going to whoop you, boy. You choose how I'm going to whoop you. An equivalent. Go out there and pick a, uh, choose a tree to pick your, uh, your twitch that I can whoop your behind with. Still dabbling in them video games, huh, man? Still pay, being a part of this world, huh? Still justifying your sin? Because you just believe, right? Crazy. <laughs> 
So Gad came to David and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Choose thee, either three years famine, or three months to be destroyed before thy foes, while that the sword of thine enemies overtake thee, or else three days the sword of the Lord, even the pestilence in the land, and the angel of the Lord destroying throughout all the coasts of Israel. Now therefore advise thyself what word I shall bring again to him that sent me. And David said unto Gad, I am in a great strait. Let me fall now into the hand of the Lord, for very great are his mercies. But let me not fall into the hand of man. So the Lord sent pestilence upon Israel. And there fell of Israel 70,000 men. Hold your place here. Go to 2 Samuel chapter 24. 2 Samuel chapter 24. Verse 17. Uh, oh, excuse me. It's verse 1. <laughs> excuse me. Uh, 2 Samuel chapter 24, verse 1. And again the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And he moved David against them to, to say, Go, number Israel and Judah. So the Lord had something with Israel. And he allowed Satan to go and provoke David to number Israel. And we see that 70,000 men of Israel died as judgment upon Israel because of what their king had done. See, the king is the ruler of the people. Good example is Manasseh. King Manasseh started out wicked, evil, worse than anybody. The Lord saved him. Okay? And then he came, was put back in power, and he worked to try to undo what he had done. Trying to let make Israel go and serve the Lord. But because of all his prolonged evil, the damage that he had done in his evil was irreversible even though he himself had been made right with the Lord, the Lord had saved him. The point is, the king and his choices affected the people. And as we saw in 2 Samuel chapter 24, verse 1, the Lord had something against some of the people in Israel. Judgment. And he allowed Satan to provoke David to bring about judgment. Are you getting a picture of where we're going with this? You are, aren't you? Yes. Good. Let's continue. And God sent an angel unto Jerusalem to destroy it. And as he was destroying, the Lord beheld, and he repented him of the evil. And said to the angel that destroyed, It is enough. Stay now thine hand. And the angel of the Lord stood by the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. And David lifted up his eyes and saw the angel of the Lord stand between the earth and the heaven, having a drawn sword in his hand, having a drawn sword in his hand stretched out over Jerusalem. Then David and the elders of Israel, who were clothed in sackcloth, fell upon their faces. Look at this. And David said unto God, Is it not I 
that commanded the people to be numbered. Look at this accountability. Look at this taking responsibility for what he had done. We're going to see a contrast to this here coming up in a little bit. Okay? But look at that. Look at that. Don't look at me. Look at that. And David said unto God, Is it not I that commanded the people to be numbered? Even I it is that have sinned and done evil indeed. But as for these sheep, what have they done? Let thine hand, I pray thee, O Lord my God, be on me and on my father's house, but not on thy people, that they should be plagued. Look at that humility. Look at that pleading. Look at that taking responsibility, being accountable. Look at that. I ask you, is there any ruler, politician today that would have that type of a heart toward the Lord? I trow not. But his question, but as for these sheep, what have they have done? What have they done? Obviously, okay, 2 Samuel chapter 24, verse 1 again. Okay, verse 1 again. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And he, okay, his anger was kindled against Israel first. And he moved David against them to say, Go number Israel and Judah. You know, God allows Satan to do what he does to bring in his judgment upon the earth. Perfect example, previous video. President Kamala Harris has been established here in America to bring judgment upon America. And whatever nation you're in, God had, obviously, God had something with some of the people of Israel. Oh, about 70,000 men. Whatever it was, we don't precisely know. But we do see here that Satan provoked David. And David in pride, it's like, I want to see, I want to see just what I got. Yeah, look at this mighty army. And after his, um, verse 8, And David said unto God, I have sinned greatly, because I have done this thing. Okay, he realizes, like, whoa, I messed up. But see, he paid a consequence for it. A mighty consequence. 70,000 people died. And the contrast in this, whereas first, he was wanting to boast in the number of people. Okay? Verse 13, And David said unto Gad, I am in a great strait. Let me fall now into the hand of the Lord. For very great are his mercies. Like to trust in him who raiseth the dead. But let me not fall into the hand of man. Where at first... He wanted to glory in man. But when it when he got when it came back to bite him, do you see? And where are our politicians? Where are our rulers that have this heart? Is it not I that commanded the people to be numbered? What have they done? They obviously, Lord. And his perfect righteousness had something with these people. We learn that by referencing 2 Samuel chapter 24, verse 1. To bring about judgment. Do you get it? See... You can take your eyes off of Jesus because the wind is boisterous. Taking your eyes off of the Lord and concentrating on the things of the world. Okay? That's the point. That's why we look at this. You are the church of the living God. You know that. You get that. But those of you who are not saved of the church of the living God, okay? The comparison? 
Peter. The Lord's like, come on. He walked on the water. He took his attention away from the Lord, who raised up the dead, and saw the wind boisterous. And he was afraid. Similar. David was provoked by the devil to take his eyes off of the Lord and to concentrate on how great his armies were. Flash. And ultimately it was to fulfill God's judgment upon his own people. 70,000 men died. See how dangerous it could be to take your attention away from the Lord and to be centered on the things of this world because the wind is boisterous and to be concentrated on men even the Jesuits go to 1st John 1st John 1st John chapter 4 1st John chapter 4 Verses 17 on to verse 20. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. Separate. Separate. Loving one another, church of the living God, showing love unto the lost by warning them of the judgment, the impending doom that is coming, and showing them the way of salvation according to the scriptures. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment, he that feareth is not made perfect in love. Now this fear is not talking about the fear of the Lord. Okay? And knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. No, this fear that he is talking about is the fear of man. The fear of this world. Perfect love casteth out fear. Perfect love for our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father. And the only way you can truly have perfect love for our Lord Jesus Christ is when you come to Him on His terms, broken and contrite. See, you easy believism devils. You did <laughs> the, per the love you have is the love of your sin. The love of this world. Perfect love. He loved us and died for us. Okay? Loving our Lord for what He did for us because of what we did to Him. That is that perfect love that casteth out fear. The fear of the world, not the fear of the Lord. Okay? These, these church building Christians will say things, how are you supposed to love someone you're afraid of? You can't love the Lord unless you fear Him. You can't love the Lord unless you fear Him. You say you love the Lord? Do you fear Him? I don't fear Him. Then you don't love the Lord. I call you a... I call you a liar. You're a liar. You say you love the Lord, but you have no fear of the Lord. Yeah, you're a liar. Perfect love for our Lord Jesus Christ casteth out fear. Fear of man. Fear of man. 
He that feareth is not... Okay, let's read that. There is no fear in love, verse 18, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. Worried about the bills, worried about what they're going to do for those who refuse the steal of the Jesuit poniard. That's kind of a quote from their secret oath, by the way. Okay? He that feareth is not made perfect in love. You're afraid of the world? Don't fear them because after they've killed the body, there ain't nothing more they can do? Fear them not, therefore. We love him because he first loved us. If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, those who are actually saved, born again, converted of the church of the living God, I might not like you. You might not like me. But if you are of the church of the living God, Sealed, born again, converted, you know. You are my brother. You are my sister. I might not like you. You might not like me, but I love you. Regardless. Regardless. I know that's kind of a, uh, with some of you. There are some of those of the Church of the Living God that I don't really get along with. But they're my brother. You're my brother. I don't get along with you. You don't get along with me. That's fine. But you are truly saved, born again, converted of the church of the living God. You're my brother. You're my sister. And vice versa. If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God love his brother also. Because we are all of his body. Okay? The fear, again, that is being talked about, go to Proverbs chapter 29. Gotta watch my time here. <laughs> Proverbs chapter 29. Verse 25. Not 30. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, uh, actually, let's read from verse 20 on to verse 27 with the stressing upon verse 25. Seest thou a man that is hasty in his words, a blabbermouth? There is more hope of a fool who says in his heart there is no God than of him. He that delicately bringeth up his servant from a child shall have him become his son at the length. An angry man stirreth up strife. Hi, all you devils. And a furious man aboundeth in transgression. A man's pride shall bring him low. But honor shall uphold the humble in spirit. Whoso is partner with a thief hateth his own soul. Why is that? Because he is a thief and a robber that goeth up some other way and not through the door. Say, like you easy believism heretics. You're not going through the door. Because you're not going through the door on his terms. Through brokenness and contrition. No, you're climbing up some other way. Whoso is partner with a thief. Whoso is partner with a thief. Hateth his own soul. He heareth cursing and bewrayeth it not. Fear of man bringeth a snare. Snare. Crap.
But whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. Many seek the ruler's favor, but every man's judgment cometh from the Lord. An unjust man is an abomination to the just. What can think of a few of you? And he that is upright in the way is an abomination to the wicked, which is why they hate us. Why they decide to make you the center of their life, while all the while thinking the whole world revolves around them. Trying, you know, trying to sit down one day and decipher, it's like, what is with these devils? You get to a point, it's like, never mind. <laughs> yeah, the fear of man bringeth a snare. But whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be saved. Many seek the ruler's favor by saying yes to the steal of the Jesuit poniard. Yeah. But every man's judgment cometh from the Lord. An unjust man is an abomination to the just, and he that is upright in the way is an abomination to the wicked. Fear of man. Fear of man. Go to 1 Samuel chapter 15. We saw King David. I have sinned and done foolishly. Lord, was it I, I, I'm the one who numbered the people. What what these what these guys do? It's my fault. I am the man. King David took a responsibility for what he had done and accepted the accountability of his actions. And we also saw that the Lord was a little angry at Israel and he used, he allowed, he allowed Satan to provoke David to bring about his judgment upon 70,000 people. But David, this is my fault. And he said, let me not fall into the hands of man. Let me fall into the hands of the Lord. Because it's mercy and death forever. That's Brad eyes. He didn't say that, but you get the point. And see, as the king, what he did affected the people. Very similar to Manasseh. Want to see a contrast to King David? A perfect one? 1 Samuel chapter 15. 1 Samuel chapter 15. We're going to read this whole chapter. I'm kidding. No, we're not. <laughs> we're not. It's like, okay, Brad. We, okay. Yeah, no. 1 Samuel chapter 15. Now, back story. The Lord said to Samuel, uh, the Lord through Samuel said to Saul, Saul, Amalek, go kill him. Go wipe him out. Then, what does it say? Verse 3, Now go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not, but slay both man and Woman, infant, and suckling, ox, and sheep, camel, and ass. That's pretty brutal. Look at verse 2. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I remember that which Amalek did to Israel, how he laid wait for him in the way when he came up out of Egypt. Instruction on righteousness right here. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I remember that which Amalek did to Israel. How he laid wait for him in the way when he came up when he came up from Egypt. We today for our instruction in righteousness, the Lord takes us out of Egypt the world out from under the headship of Satan Pharaoh. Okay? Okay. Amalek Amalek there, what he did to Israel how he laid wait for him 
in the way when he came out of uh, Egypt. Our Lord saves you. Satan is there immediately to tempt you, to veer you off in other ways. Do you see? The Lord uh, brings us out of Egypt. The world saves us, calls us to be holy, separate. And Emelech uh, waited, you know, what does it say there? How he laid wait for him in the way when he came out, up, out from Egypt. Get it? Because of what he did to his people. God is a God of judgment. God is a God of vengeance. He said, destroy everybody. Yes, he did. So, what does Saul do? Verses 13 on to verse 15. And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said unto him, Blessed be thou of the Lord, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. That statement right away. That's the first thing he said to, Saul, uh, to Samuel when he saw him. Hey, I did the work of the Lord. That's a statement of guilt. Why? And Samuel said, What meaneth then this bleating of the sheep in mine ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? Saul didn't do it. See, that's a guilty statement. He's like, I did what the Lord said, knowing that he didn't. That's a statement of guilt, even though he's coming like, hey, I did, look at me. <laughs> no, no, no. It's a statement of guilt. Verse 15. And Saul said, They have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God. And the rest we have utterly destroyed. I've heard it put like in hellish, satanic, corporate America that when things go well in a corporation, oh, I'm, thank you for you know, the attention is on one. But whenever, when things go wrong, it's we have done this wrong. We need to do better. When things are going good in corporate, hellish, satanic corporate America, in businesses, it all reflects good onto the one in charge, right? But in corporate America, when it goes bad, it's a collective. We have done. We need to do this. Isn't that interesting? When we saw King David... I, four times, I have done this. I did this. It's me. My fault. Lord, what, what, it's, I'm the one who did this. What did they do? And look at Saul. Look at that verse. They have brought them from the Amalekites for the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice, I like, I love this. Unto the Lord, thy God. Not my God, your God. See that? And the rest, we utterly destroy. Skip to verses 20 on to verse 23. And Saul said unto Samuel, Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. Samuel rebukes him. <laughs> uh, no, no, you haven't. You haven't done this. And you're blaming others and not taking responsibility. And Saul said unto Samuel, Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord, and have gone the way which the Lord sent me, and have brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. No, he didn't. Because the Lord said, kill them all. Everything. They wouldn't have been having this conversation if Saul had done what the Lord had said. Look at verse 21. 
Who did Saul fear? But the people. This is the king. This is the king. This is what, this is a picture of our rulers today, our politicians. But the people took of the spoil, sheep and oxen. The chief of the things which should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God in Gilgal, separating this thing seen himself. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices? Buddy, as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. What is that um, in Colossians where Paul says that covetous is idolatry? What was Saul coveting? He was the king. Praises of men. He had the fear of man. Politicians, they have the fear of the Jesuits, not the fear of the Lord. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Who are you idolizing? Having men's person in admiration because of advantage. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. Now scoot down to verse... Oh, no, let's, let's continue reading. To verse 31. And Saul said unto Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and thy words. Because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. He had to put that little thing in. Yeah, I sinned. Because of the people. But, there's a but there. Get your butt out. See, the old man... Yeah, God, it's your fault because you gave me the woman and because you gave me this woman and she took of the tree and I ate. So, yeah, I sinned, but it's your fault. Yeah, a half-hearted, half-hearted repentance, half-hearted. Yeah, yeah, I have sinned. For I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and thy works and thy words because I feared the people. And obeyed their voice. Now therefore I pray thee. Pardon my sin. And turn with me. And turn again with me. That I may worship the Lord. And Samuel said unto Saul. I will not return with thee. For thou hast rejected the word of the Lord. And the Lord hath rejected thee from being king over Israel. And as Samuel turned about to go away. He laid hold upon the skirt of his mantle and rent it. And Samuel said unto him, The Lord hath rent the kingdom of Israel from thee this day, and hath given it to a neighbor of thine that is better than thou. And also the strength of Israel will not lie nor repent, for he is not a man that he should repent. Then he said, I have sinned. Now, remember what we looked at about how King David reacted? Yet, honor me now, I pray thee, before the elders of my people. 
and before Israel. And turn with me, and turn again with me, that I may worship the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God. So Samuel turned again after Saul, and Saul worshiped the Lord. Look at that. Saul didn't have a genuine repentance. Even in his so-called repentance, where it's like, yeah, I sinned, he still put the people before the Lord. He still had man's, um, man's, uh, Admir uh, the, uh, the admiration of man because of advantage. Okay? I know I just said that, but it lost, uh, went from my mind. He still put people above the Lord. It's their fault. No accountability, no responsibility. Half hearted responsibility he took. Whereas King David. And today, brother and sister, I don't care what nation you're in under heaven. Saul, <laughs> pretty much the ruler of all, isn't he? <laughs> Fear man bringeth the snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be made safe. The Lord will provide for you. You have to have trust on Him. And go as He would have you to go. You align your... Uh, I, I'm going to say this to you until, it's, until you're sick of it. You align your life with the Scriptures. And walk as He would have you to walk. And He... He feed his sheep. Because does he not make the rain, uh, the sun shine on the just and the unjust? Does he not give food to all? Yes, he does. But he will provide for his own. He will feed his own sheep. That's going to do it for this video. Like I said, this was a collaborated effort between a brother and I, and also, as I had mentioned, um, going off of some other things that another brother had mentioned to me before. Like, I, brethren, brethren, this is a collaborated effort. This is not a one-man show. Even though I do, you know, I, yes. But I don't do this all by just me. The Church of the Living God helps. Yes, you see me. Yes, the Lord and I, my wife helps, and also my friend, our brother helps, and other brothers help. Yes, yes. And yes, you see me here. Yes. But it's not just me. Others help. You know, so like I say, this, all of this is a collaborated effort. This couldn't be done. None of this could be done without the Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father. Every single one of you. And I understand that there are those of you out there who are hurting right now because of what they are doing. That doesn't make our love for you any less. Our Lord will feed his sheep. Don't forget about that. Thank you, brethren. Love you. Thank you for watching this if you do. Thank you to my beloved brother. Thank you to all of you. All of you. Church of the Living God. And apparently, it gonna rain. <laughs> so, we'll see you in the next video.